Welcome to Aveiro Tech Week, an event that combines technology, arts and culture. Today's session is dedicated to sustainable solutions for our city, our planet and beyond. Please welcome on stage our moderator Sara Moreno Pires from the University of Aveiro and Carlina Ficano from Artwick College, New York. Also remotely welcome Mattis Waker Nigel, president of Global Footprint Network. Boa tarde a todos. Estão a ouvir bem? Good afternoon. Sim. Uh, eu vou começar em português, uh, apenas like para dar as boas-vindas a todos na nossa língua materna e para felicitar. Uh, podemos tirar can a máscara? Can, 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 you, can you remove our masks? Posso? Can I? Sim. Ok. Obrigada. Great. Todos estando? Todos. <laughs> Obrigada. Uh, queria cumprimentar todos, fechar a sessão uh, e começar a sessão em português and para let me start uh, felicitar por um lado a Câmara Municipal de Aveiro e o da equipa que está por trás desta Tech Week, uh, e sobretudo o colocar no centro a cidade, o colocar no a arte e a tecnologia, Art, technology um, and culture. And I will move on to, to English to congratulate uh, and to welcome all to this session. Uh, to welcome Matis that is online with us in the United States <laughs> and he will be the first um, guest speaker and I will introduce all our, all our other uh, speakers. Um, and I would like to first say some, some words um, just because it's 
uh, vital to understand the importance of cities and why cities are at the center of this, uh, of this debate today and of this tech week. And, and cities are territories that um, contribute to, but they also face a challenge without borders that, don't, uh, uh, are, that are not close to the borders of the cities. And cities that we can touch, we can feel, we can live, they are part of our real life, of our real world, but cities that are also part of an immaterial uh, uh, relationship, an immaterial system, they are part of an intangible global common as our earth system, um, and cities that are places also of unintended and unpredictable uh, consequences, unpredictable relationships in an ever more predictable future. <laughs> I'm sure that uh, you will uh, know these, these uh, subtitles soon. Above all, cities are, uh, they hold the key for the future of, of humanity. And, and it's also uh, um, really important to place art and culture at the center of this debate. Um, they are probably, art and culture, the catalysts uh, for, for sustainability, probably one of the most important sectors that can trigger faster and, and more disruptive changes in society. So I think that uh, it's through art, through culture, that we can educate us, illuminate us, as human, humans, towards a new vision, a new um, cosmovision of, of the world. Uh, and finally, to place technology, technology for a sustainable future, or as you will see, uh, better explain for a sustainable tomorrow because we feel that the future is too far away from us and, and to feel like the future is tomorrow. It's important to realize the world of technology and how we can connect uh, all these three uh, uh, big uh, dilemmas, cities and all the, the contradictions in cities, arts and culture and technology through education, through communities, through debates, through involvement of all of us. Uh, so, I hope this is going to be an amazing session with inspiring guest speakers. It is an honor, an honor to have them with us today in Aveiro, remotely or face-to-face. -face. Um, and our uh, session today is going to be, as you uh, heard, and you are here because you probably know the title, of Sustainable Solutions for Our City, Our Planet and Beyond. Uh, uh, I'm sure that it's going to be an extra opportunity to learn and debate um, different uh, paths for a one, the one planet, the only one planet that we have and the one planet cities that we want to build. Um, we will have uh, two presentations in English and two presentations in Portuguese. So it's also a very interesting mix of cultures and, and languages. Uh, I hope we can all manage to, with translation, to follow the discussion. So I will start to welcome and to introduce Matis Wackernagel that is with us, and you can see him remotely. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, Matis is the founder and the president of Global Footprint Network, and he's created with, with uh, Bill Rees uh, the footprint concept uh, in the early 90s. Uh, with the carbon footprint being one of the most popular um, variant of uh, this methodology. In 2003, he was also founded, he founded the Global Footprint Network, a sustainability think tank, most known for its annual Earth Overshoot Day, Dia da Supercarga, uh, and he, his, honors, his honors include 2018 World Sustainability Award, and in 2015, the Yaya Global Environment Awards and the 2012 Blue Planet Prize. So I welcome Matis, and he is going to discuss with us the ever more predictable future. Thank you. The floor is yours, Matis. Thank you so much, Sarah, for having us here. It's wonderful. It has been such a pleasure to work with you over the last few years and your institute. And uh, it's exciting to even look into the future with you. If we can have the first slide, I'm not sure if it's working. I'm just going to say next when they show the slide. Okay. Can you show the slides right now? We can see the slides. So oh. you can see the slides, but I cannot see the slides. So I don't know where we are. So that, now it's excellent. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> we are in the first slide. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's wonderful. So okay. I'm really glad. Actually, I'm going to take the, the mic. I'm hearing too much echo. So um, I'm really glad the session is happening at Tech Week because there are still some very significant innovation gaps at the, on the city level. And so you all are actually needed uh, to get over this innovation gap because there is a predictable future, as I will be talking about. But at the same time, that's why I put the title here, are we lost? Do we feel lost? Next. <laughs> so as many of you will know, there will be a big conference um, next uh, called COP26, November on climate change. And if you go to that website, it says there, the UK government or the UK is committed to working with all countries and joining forces with civil society, companies and people on the front line of climate change to inspire climate action ahead of COP26. Now let me translate that for you next. I translate it into good people will save the day through voluntary heroic action. Is that really the situation we are facing? Next. I think it's actually a little bit different. We are on this lovely boat, on a ride, next. The cloud is getting bigger, next. Even bigger, the storm is coming, we realize, oh my God, my boat is not that well built. It's not ready for the storm. So what would be the best action? Would it be to have an international conference to get together with all the boat owners of the world and say, okay, who needs to fix their boat first? I will wait to fix my boat until everybody else is fixing your boat. How much boat fixing are you willing to contribute? Isn't that a bit silly? Next one. So I think it's actually quite a different context we live in. Not that, oh, the world needs saving, but how much am I willing to contribute? But that the future has never been more predictable. There will, we will want to sleep and eat and be housed and there will be more climate change and fewer ecological resources in any path we can imagine. For example, if we act very fast on climate change, we move out of fossil fuels very, very rapidly, very rapidly. And that means there will still be more climate change because that still will take a little bit more carbon emissions. And at the same time, we will not have available fossil fuels. So that will be tighter. Or the other extremes that, oh, we won't do anything, we just see what happens, that will mean much, much more climate change leading to much more erratic weather, much more erratic agricultural production, a loss of biological regeneration. Um, and then we also will therefore have fewer ecological resources. You know? so, so whatever future we look forward to is about one of climate change and fewer resources and particularly also ecological resources. And energy. So given that, next, what's the real question? Can we afford not to be ready for the predictable future? So it's the exact opposite. It's not, oh, let's wait till everybody agrees and we'll do something. But actually, if everybody decides not to do anything, if the next climate conference disappoints us, the need for you to get prepared for the future that is predictable gets even stronger. So that's not an overwhelming message. It's actually a message saying, wow, you're in the driver's seat. It matters what you do for yourself. You're not caught by having to wait for others. Next. So the world has changed. We call it now the Anthropocene. In the past, we were quite small compared to the size of the planet. But now we've become the biggest force, the geological force. That's why we're called the Anthropocene. And that's not just an interesting description. It shifts the dynamics of the world economically. Let me just paint the numeric picture to start with, and then we'll see what, what it means for our lives. Next, if we look at the world from a biological perspective, because ultimately the biological resources are the most significant ones, the most limiting ones, much more limiting than the iron on the ground or even the oil on the ground, because we cannot burn all the fossil fuels that we already found because there's too little biosphere to cope with the waste. So it's really the regenerative, the renewable resources that are the most limiting factor for our ability to operate well on this planet. 
when we look at how much is available per person, we just take the entire productive space on the planet, including productive ocean space, etc. We divide it by number of people on the planet, it's now about close to 8 billion people according to the United Nations. Then we get roughly 1.6 global hectares of ecologically productive space. I say global hectares because they're averaged out, so we can actually compare them across different landscapes, different countries, etc. That's about 1.6 soccer fields per person in the world. That needs to provide for everything we have. For our food, for our fiber, to absorb our waste, to accommodate our cities, etc. So how much do we use next? What we use is significantly more. 2.75 global hectares per person. How is it possible that we can use more than what is available? It's like with money, you can spend more money than what you earn. Obviously not recommendable, but it's possible, and that means you dip into your assets, you become, you, you destroy our asset, your assets, huh? so you overspend. It's possible for some time, not forever. It's possible until you go bankrupt. So next one. So the ratio between how much we have and how much we use is about 1.73 at the global level. And obviously, these are the average, this is the total humanity as a whole. There are huge differences between countries, between people within countries, huge differences. But as a total, human demand is 73% larger than what Earth can renew. Next one. So that's about like using 1.73 Earth. Now let's also remember, we are not the only ones using biocapacity. All the wild animal species want that, that too. Next and next. So what, what you will, but if, you, if you listen to, to E.O. Wilson, who is one of the most eminent, now emeritus professors in, in biology and biodiversity, he says if we use half the Earth's capacity, then we can about safeguard 85% of biodiversity. Maybe we want to not safeguard as many, maybe we want to safeguard more, but let's use that as a reference point. We say, okay, half of the budget could be for humans and the rest of the budget for the other 10 million species. So then the difference between how much humanity uses and how much the budget would be on a sustainable basis is about factor three apart. Factor three apart. Now, next one, we can also translate that into another way of understanding it. So if humanity uses 1.73 Earth, then you can also say that between January 1st and this year it was July 29th, we as humanity, humanity has used as much as Earth can renew in the entire year of 2021. That's called Earth Overshoot Day. Next. Now, what's the reaction to it? Now we're getting to, okay, how do we take the future in our hands? We say, actually, the choice is very simple. One planet prosperity. Because the alternative is one planet misery. The one planet is not going away. I mean, it will take quite a while until we can get more back from Mars than it takes to get to Mars. You know, So there's the one planet constraint. Do we want prosperity or misery on this planet? How do we generate one planet prosperity? We call it move the date next. Move the date. And the question really is next. What solutions do you love? Now it's quite simple to think about what are the options what we can do to move the date. Here, move the date. On one hand, what can we do? We can increase the productivity of nature by conserving it and by having regenerative agriculture and by restoring ecosystems, etc. I mean, we cannot double it, but we can safeguard it. It's a very important part. Then we can also work on demand, which has four big dimensions. One is how do we build our, and operate our cities? And actually, if you think you get educated by your parents, even more by your city. How is your city built? That it dictates how you shop, how you walk around, how far you have to go, how much it takes to keep your house cool or, and, and warm. You know? So all these things are driven by the way cities are operated and, and, and shaped. So urban design is very significant. The second one is also how do we power ourselves in these cities? Are we using solar power or are we using coal power, for example? It makes a big difference. 
then obviously, how do we eat? About half of the biocapacity of the planet today is occupied just for food with 8 billion people. And then the last one is how many people are we? If we are double as many people, there's only half as, many plan uh, half as much planet per person. If we had reproductive rates of Portugal, for example, around the world, and I don't understand there's a population program in Portugal. It's just what happened because of the, the way societies move. If we had that around the world, we'd be at four and a half billion people by 2100. And I've already met people who are, will be born, or who will, be, who will live in 2100. You know, people born today, they may be 80 or 79, actually, in, in 2100. The current trajectory is 11 billion people. But there's also, it's a, it's a very slow moving factor population, but also a significant one. That's why we ask you, you, what are the solutions that you love? And we did just a little advent calendar. Next one, if you go to 100 days of possibility, uh, every day we, we show something new right, in these categories that I just mentioned. Uh, and then you can see, well, wow, how interesting. And that's just 100 possibilities. There are many more. There are many more. And one possibility is just exactly in Portugal, and that's why I'm so excited to participate. I would love actually to be with you. Uh, and Sarah, thank you so much for inviting me again. So next one, when you look at the project that we have done in Portugal, is actually look at this very question. Say, how do we deal with this reality in a way that we strengthen our cities? And uh, so, so we have started to work together. The next one, uh, it's now I think 18, cities that we have engaged with, thanks to Zero and to the, the University of Avera, um, to just look at exactly that. Next one, how is your ecological footprint? What does it mean? There's a website that you can look at more, that explains more. And then here's just some results. Next one, to say, how do cities differ? And this is just average, again, from, for each city. Within cities, there are huge differences. And what is interesting is not just that the footprint is different, but obviously their access to biocapacity is also quite significantly different. And what becomes clear is that in the future of climate change and resource constraints, those who are resource secure, who are able to provide their good lives on far fewer resource demand and have the resources available as well, will just be in a much, much safer position. Of course, there's much more detail than just the overall footprint. For example, next one, we can break it down and say, what's driving this demand? For example, here's a breakdown by various activities for. Um, Almada, just as an example, uh, and, and, and then very exciting, of course, the question is, what's going to happen with Alvira? Uh, what's the footprint of Alvira? Next one. And I will reveal nothing, because I want to keep it interesting for you. We are soon able to kind of finish that study as well and see where are we at, what are the opportunities here, what are the challenges, where should we go. Now to close the conversation, the following. There's one particularly important chemical formula I just want to show next that's going to determine where we want to be. If we want to have a chance not to have runaway climate change, we need to get to zero CO2 probably well before 2050. When I mean zero CO2, actually CO2 equivalent, I mean greenhouse gases, extra greenhouse gases, net emissions, particularly from fossil fuels. That means meaning moving out of fossil fuels in its entirety well before 2050. And that's why I'm going to bring up this next number. Next slide. So everybody born after 1985 for sure will be in the workforce still in 2050. So. If you're born after 1985, over your professional life, you will have to oversee how we move an economy that is entirely dependent on fossil fuels to one that doesn't depend on fossil fuels. That's a huge construction project. It needs incredible innovation, capacities. I know Portugal is actually, of the countries in Europe, on, on the leading side of thinking about how to build this transformation. And still, we are still all far behind. So the future is coming more quickly than we can adjust our infrastructure. And that's why the race has already begun. But let me also summarize as this next one. It's not just a heroic act. It's actually self-care. Building sustainable cities is very much like brushing your teeth. If you brush your teeth, 
you're not taking care of the present, you're also taking care of your future. You're avoiding the cavities of the future. It's not a noble act for others. It helps you to have good teeth. In the same way, if you invest in your city, you make it ready for the future we can anticipate, you will be able to live in a city that is functional in the future we can anticipate. Next slide, that's the end. Again, sustainability is much more like brushing teeth. It's not a noble act. It's necessary to maintain your own well-being. And we are looking forward to exploring this even more with you. And I will thank particularly again Sarah for having been wonderful partners in Portugal. And uh, there's an exciting future in front of us. Thank you. I think. <laughs> Thank you so much. It, it's always uh, uh, really embracing to, to listen to you and to um, make and to see how you make people feel that a different future can be enjoyable, can be <laughs> the, the future we love to and the, the choices that we can do now that uh, we are not scared to, to, to take them, but that we enjoy them. And so that's a very important message to, to follow. Thank you so much. And I, I will make you a short question, but I hope you can stay with us for the conversation. And I'm sure that of I course. can open the debate at the end. But just, if you allow me, just to make you a short question, because with COVID pandemic, uh, we, we quickly changed by disaster, as you once said. And are we now more ready than before to change, not by disaster, but by planning? Are the UK, as we started to say, are we really uh, afford to not to be ready and is the pandemic or the pandemic changed anything on our capacity to understand the global challenges we face? That's not a question for me, that's a question for everybody else. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready too. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I will, I will keep this uh, uh, readiness throughout our debate uh, today. And I, I will uh, ask uh, people then to uh, uh, debate with you in the, uh, uh, after all the presentations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so now we will go on uh, in, in, in Portuguese uh, with a presentation uh, of a speaker that was not able to be with us. And he kindly record a video uh, uh, to stay, uh, to be able to, to, to tell us uh, um, a really nice Cosmo vision of the, of the world. Um, and so I will, um, we, it's going to be a little bit difficult uh, to interact, but we have the opportunity to listen this, uh, this video. Uh, professor Celso Prudente uh, é professor da Universidade professor Federal de Mato Grosso. Prudente, he's a professor uh, at the Federal University uh, uh, of Mato Grosso and he's here to present his primogenet African cosmovision respecting the diversity, the pedagogical uh, diversity of uh, é the African-American cinema. Pela Universidade de São Paulo. Uh, doctor by the University of São Paulo. I do apologize, the Black Cinema. So he was um, also at the University of Mato Grosso in Brazil. He's an anthropologist, a filmmaker, a curator in the exhibition of Black Cinema. He's a researcher of Latin America, sort on cultural communication. He's a presenter and director of a radio program in São Paulo. He's the director of many movies since 1987, the first Ache movie the soul of a people up to the color of voting or the color of the vote. It's an animation video. So here's the video of Professor Celso. We would like to ask you to show the video. And I would like to reiterate that it's black cinema, not African American. It is a privilege to be part of this Aveiro seminar. Let me also thank the Bodotec, represented by uh, Professor Adelito Marcos Fernandes, and to the all, all the team who was able to work in this event. I will 
é, nesse certame soluções sustentáveis para a nossa talk cidade, about sustainable planeta, solutions for our city I will talk about the, co the African Cosmovision as the genesis of a respect for biodiversity, the pedagogical dimension of black cinema, black filmmaking is put at stake here. I'm Celso Luis Prudente, I'm a doctor in culture by the University of São Paulo. Postdoctorate in linguistics by the Institute of Language Studies from Unicamp, and I'm also a professor of the Federal University of Mato Grosso. I'm an anthropologist, a filmmaker, and the curator of the International Exhibition of Black Cinema. I'm a researcher of the, study of the Latin American Study Center on Culture and Communication, which is the CELAC of the School of Communication and Arts of USP. And and I'm also the director and presenter of the Quilombo Academia program of the USP radio, the radio of the University of Sao Paulo. The African Cosmovision as the genesis of the respect for agrodiversity, the pedagogical dimension of black cinema that is put at stake. We will talk about the singularity of the sacred knowledge of the African cosmovision that was already known in terms of biodiversity. This means that the African cosmovision already knew the respect for biodiversity. It was the first expression of knowledge of the respect for biodiversity. It was the African cosmovision, first born. And it is an understanding of the horizontality that is defined in the circularity relationships where all the points are side by side. Nothing, nothing is above the other. All the expressions, all the things, all the existential shapes, bioexistential, they are side by side within an horizontal line without a possibility of vertical relationships. And this is very important. The measure that this relation circularity happen in points where all the existentials are side by side, there is no possibility of vertical relationships between themselves. For the African cosmovision, all the expressions of bioexistentiality have the same weight and importance. No one has more, no existential shape is more important than the other. Without that one is established as a power over the other, considering that this relationship means in a domination and subordination, and it is within this connection of domination and subordination that the prejudice will establish. The African cosmovision is unknown to the relationship that implies or implicated in domination or subordination that ends up determining the prejudice. For the important African cultures, for the be existential expressions are a reflex of the holy divinity and if all these bioexistential expressions are a portrait of the sacred deity, divinity, there cannot be a prejudice between them because all of them mean 
that the deity itself becomes. So if they are established as being the deity itself, then it's not possible that the prejudice happens amongst them. So it is important that we can understand that outside of this African cosmovision, we start to see in these vertical relationships what Caetano Veloso, an important poet and composer, Brazilian, talks about the strength of money that destroys beautiful things, the ugly smoke that goes up and erases the stars. The strength of the money that destroys its domination, its power, is the verticality, that it's very important in terms of authority to what's different. Of course, the ugly smoke, the ugly smoke that raises and rises and erases the star has to do with wars, destruction, and underlying it, there is always money, there is always power, there is always the hegemonic powers. Caetano Veloso, Brazilian poet. The African cosmovision is defined in connections that are existential, that are marked by the existential relationship. So we understand that within the African cosmovision, the existential relations that are marked with relations that are complex, of biodiversity, in points, in common points in a line of horizontality. This telluric definition of, a, of Africa, of ecological relationships that clearly show a paradigm of symbolic relationships of the everyday life. So this way of existing within the scope of horizontality of the ecological relationships as a symbol will be in the everyday life. This horizontality that the parts from relationships of circularity will be in the routine, in the everyday life, characterized by a vision of the world whose relationships in terms of sacred circularity will provide that they will provide all the sources with that are co-substantial of ecological relationships. The ontology of Africa is, in its African cosmovision, is in the land, a continent, where the ecological relationships that dictate and are a symbol, a paradigm, a reference to all the relationships that are symbolic of the everyday life. This contradicts the relations of linearity that impregnate the Western gaze, which is determined by the logic of accumulation of Euro-trading uh, tra Euro perspective. This unilaterality of the Western gaze comes to determine the logic of accumulation, which is essential of the trading perspective. Ora, nós vamos ver que há na cosmovisão africana in this African cosmovision, there is a temporality to it. And this temporality, this movement, this sound, this way of existing of the sound, of the drumming, of the movement, which is this 
drumming initiative. It's the praxeology where all the relationships of biodiversity are established in a plan of virtue and ritual where all the shapes biological are expressions of the deity, making it impossible that between them are relationships of prejudice, because if all of them are expressions of a deity, the prejudice will be against it. So, they are expressions of deity, this will make it impossible any relations between prejudice. It's a mythical demand of this process of rituality configurating in the dynamics of existential happiness, of a sound, of a movement that are marked by dancing and drumming, because for the African person there is no difference between dance and music. Dancing and music, they shape a relationship, a connection that it is impossible to be seen in a way that's different. It's a single thing, dance and music, this is something common and that cannot be dissolved. Then we will see precisely the vision of the world that's linear, of the Caucasian, the problem of this linear vision of a Euro Western person is comes from this teleology. This meaning is definition of an end, of a purpose, because this problem of the ends, it's a pivotal element of the relationships that determine the logical hoarding of accumulating of the Euro-Caucasian value of exchange, determining this vision, this view, European, of trading, and this comes from the logic of accumulation of the value comes to indicate a euro hetero male that is authoritarian and this is determined by the euro hetero normativity and what does this mean the standardization hetero male. It is following the sense of being the Eurocentric view thus establishing as a measure for all measures. This is shown as one thing that more than makes it happen by violence, by authoritarian initiatives. There are different views, different measures, those expressions that are different to us. This criticism of mine, it dialogues with the understanding of Jean-Paul Sartre. Sartre said and observes that the white man has lived without being observed. Its gaze was dominating. This behavior, this colonial behavior, is a sense of the depreciative domination that can beat with violence for the environment, where profit is the reason of all relationships. And it becomes weird, it becomes third to these relationships is that they suffer the reductionary attempt of this euro hetero standardization normativity, which is the sense and the reason of the Eurocentric view that is thus established as a measure and as a law for the different, those that are different for the others. 
by means of violence and authoritarian fear. We will see that the prejudice, the genesis, is the Aristotelic train of thought against the former, and we know that this train of thought is the genesis of the Euro-Western thinking that has found in Greek mythology its actions, considering that agriculture has a sense to it. And it symbolizes by the goddess Demeter. She's the goddess of agriculture. So Aristoteles says that the farmer will not have any right to citizenship. Why? Why not? According to Aristoteles, because they work the land, and the land is not important, agriculture is not important, because it has a goddess which is feminine. From henceforth, it is pertinent to suggest that the prejudice has a structure to it, of different prejudices, and it is a prejudice that becomes a network of prejudices. So in each of them there is a different one in the structure or the structure of the others. Namely, the prejudice of gender, of race, of ethnicity and religion. It's very important to define that prejudice is a structure that has a structure of other prejudices, so it is a network of prejudice, if you will. Going against the genesis of thinking of the Western world, there is also Aristotelic, which is beneath the prejudice, understanding that the farmer could not be, have the right to citizenship because they worked with the land and agriculture. With the deity of a woman, which was the goddess, the Mete. And it's very important that all the strengths, the way of being, of culture, that are different to the Euro-Western definition, such as the Iberian, Iberian cultures. Why? Because Iberian is not European. Iberian is seen as a citizen of second category, second class citizen in the context of Europe and only became part of colonization forced by Europe and it was a tool of this colonization. The colonization that in favor of the industrial revolution those who get rich with the Industrial Revolution is not Portugal and Spain, but England. So Portugal and Spain were instrumentalized by this definition. They were protagonists of colonization, but they were also concomitantly as an object. So all the expressions of culture different in terms of Euro-Western perspective, like Iberian, Asian, African, and Indian American, will follow in a sense of an horizontality that's democratic, that shapes the image of the Indian and the Afro-Indian. Why this Lusophony of democratic horizontality? They shape this in terms of horizontality in democracy that will point out to the image of the Asian Indian 
or the American Indian, because this comes from the Euro-Western colonization that has determined the power of the euro hetero male authoritarian, which is determined by the standardization of the hetero and authoritarian view. Both these views become more clear and with more motivation, starting from the definition of the revolution of 74. Because Portugal then becomes in a common plan as the ancient colonies in the plan of freedom, of sovereignty, and the end of any possibility of authoritarian and dictatorial. And within this plan is that this element of the Asian Indian, American Indian divides an image ontological struggle in order to put an end to Eurocentrism, Caucasian, that the stereotype tries to belittle the universes that are strange to it. So, what are they? Iberian, Asian, African, and American Indian. This restoration of the image that this element will initiate, starting from the philosophy of horizontality, happens via the restoration of the image of the black cinema. Why? And this is the minority. They are also in a minority connected to the, this element in terms of the standardization. And this competes into a negative image of inferiority of this man that via the black cinema will make this image of statement because in the black cinema minorities take on the role of historical subject building their own image against the stereotype brought forward by this element that I spoke about of the authoritarian hetero male. Here you have the bibliographic references and once again thank you for having me in this important conference and I would like to leave my regards with you all to all organizers and participants for a losophony of democratic horizontality. We do apologize for the interpreting booth. We did not have previous access to the text, which was riddled with literary references. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Celso Prudente. Thank you for your ability um, to make us travel through time and culture and these relationships that are established in different cultures. And it's a shame not to have you with us so that we could extend this debate associated to the um, other speakers that we have in the room. Let me call on stage the, the magnificent rector of IFAM, Jaime Cavalcante Alves. Pleasure to have you. Thank you for being here. Uh, eu vou continuar em inglês para apresentar a nossa próxima oradora, que percebe muito bem português, apesar de ser <laughs> americana, uh, norte-americana. E eu passo a apresentar a professora uh, Carlena Ficano. Uh, a professora Carlena, Carlena uh, is Ficano. professor of She's economics at the Artwick College um, in Oneonta, New York, 
uh, United States of America, sorry, <laughs> where she teaches uh, in labor economics, uh, public policy and applied econometrics. Uh, her current research interests include the application of network mapping to local food systems and food system optimization at the state level. Carlena was a founding organizing at the Artwick College Center for Craft Food and Beverage, and he's now a collaborator uh, on the initiation of the Artwick College Grain Innovation Center, both of which are university-sponsored uh, ventures promoting regional agriculture economic development. Uh, beyond the university, Carolina serves as the executive board of the Center for Agricultural Development and Entrepreneurship uh, and is a member of the CAD Vision 2015 research team. So it is really a pleasure uh, to have you with us and please, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes? Great. And I'm going to take my mask off if that's okay. Perfect. Um, so, so thank you, um, Sarah, for, for the invitation. And it's, it's humbling and a great pleasure to be here from the United States um, in such a, an important conversation amongst such illustrious presenters. So um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit today um, about networks and about the potential for networks to help us transition to a new food system, um, and also the role of universities and colleges across the globe in that networking and in that transition. Um, and um, I don't, can you control the slides from where you are, or should I control here? Let's see if I can do. Okay, perfect. Um, so, so we begin with why are we having this, this conversation at all? And I'm, I'm pulling from the work of our first presenter, Dr. Uh, Mathis Wagernackel and the Global Footprint Network. Um, this is a, a series of images that I use regularly in my class, not with Portugal, but, but the one on the left, um, that we are currently borrowing from our future. I'm here today with my daughter. Um, we're borrowing from our, from our children's lives, and increasingly we're borrowing from our own. Um, what we're consuming is exceeding our capacity. I don't think there needs much um, description um, given our first presenter, um, other than to say that, that we're on an unsustainable path. It's getting worse. Um, the future is now. Um, the future is not in, in, in the, um, the long-awaited distance, it's, it's at our doorstep. Um, and the United States, where I am representing, is certainly a big part of the problem, um, um, as are many countries across, across the globe. So we have a big problem that we have to tackle, and as our first presenter said, we have to do it now. If we go inside of that problem, and start to, to disentangle the systems that are causing the problems, um, food comes up repeatedly as a, as a source of concern. And um, this slide that I'm sharing is from a recent report by the Rockefeller Foundation, um, who sought to quantify the externalities associated with food uh, consumption and production in the United States. And they looked across um, many, many published studies using publicly available data. Um, and the conclusion they came up with is that we spend about $1.1 trillion on food. And in so doing, we generate another $2.1 trillion in external costs. Um, and just to go a little bit deeper into, into their methodology, um, they bucketed those external costs into five different categories and looked at the cost of either preventing, compensating, or, or um, remediating um, those, those different externalities. The largest was human health, um, so issues of um, obesity, um, chronic disease, um, environmental degradation, loss of biodiversity, reliance on exploitation of, of labor, sort of speaking to the, um, the, the previous presenter. Um, and then also in the United States, we spend a great deal of money um, in terms of, of tax dollars subsidizing that, that same um, system. 
Um, another report using a slightly different methodology and a different set of data came up with a very similar um, result. This is from the Ellen Mac MacArthur Foundation, foundation excuse me, another foundation. Um, for every dollar that we spend on food in the United States, um, we, we generate um, $2 of, of negative cost. And if we return to the, the idea of the ecological footprint, which um, is, I think, one of the most powerful ways of, of thinking about what we're doing to our world. Um, I teach economics in the United States, and on the first day of my class, I have students calculate their ecological footprint because I think it tells a, a very powerful story. This is slightly dated. This is from 2015, but in the United States, um, the calculation um, was made in something called the Sustainable Lifestyles Report um, that 17% of our global um, overshoot is coming from the food sector. And work done by um, Dr. Sarah Peeridge and Alessandro Galli and others, um, more recently an amazing um, paper which I recommend highly, um, did an analysis in Portugal and 29% of, um, of the, the ecological footprint in this country is food. So, so what does this mean? It means that we have a big problem, we're consuming too much. It means that food is a part of that problem and a not insignificant part of that problem. But it also means that food is, is a potential lever for change. It's a potential way for us to move in the right direction. So then we take a step back, and I can only speak to the United States, but I can talk a little bit about what is going on with, with food system policy right now in the United States. Um, so a, an analysis that was done in 2020 um, by an organization called the Environmental Working Group um, identified um, that between 2014 and 2020, we spent $81 billion in the United States on direct agricultural subsidies. And two-thirds of those went to the top 10%, the richest and largest 10% of our agricultural producers, and one quarter went to the top 1%. So we have a, a tsunami, a, a tidal wave of support for the status quo that's generating the global overshoot that we talked about in the first slides. At the same time, we have many, many, many um, small, in the United States, it's, it's largely nonprofits, but also municipalities swimming against that current in their own spheres of interest, but swimming against the current largely in isolation from one another. And again, referencing um, uh, the most recent presenter, I feel like I should turn that slide on its side now, because it really is sort of a, a, a um, domination and subservience um, situation. Um, we're spending a lot of money supporting a system that's making us sicker, and we have lots of people working in isolation against that large system, in many situations fighting against each other for, for the financial support they need to do the good work that they're doing. So this is a sobering bit of reality. I don't know if it's the same in Portugal. I don't know if it's the same in, in the European Union, but I can speak to what's, what's happening in, to, in the United States. Um, as, as Dr. Pierce mentioned, I'm a labor economist, and when I see this kind of a, a picture, um, I think of, of monopoly power and, and monopsony power and, and labor unions and the importance of collective voice um, so that those many small arrows on the left can, can optimize. Um, and my, my most recent thinking, and, and I'm just at the very beginning of these projects, is that the picture I showed you in the previous slide aligns well with work that's, that's been done for a long time, but it's really gaining traction in, in networks, in social networks. And what the network literature tells us is that the situation, that box on the far left, where lots of, of individual entities are working in isolation, is not the best way for collective impact. And what, in fact, we want is a more aggregated network, that box all the way on the right. So there's lots of evidence that efficacy comes from that interconnectedness 
And we see that in, in biological systems and we see that in social systems. The second thing that the network literature tells us is that getting from the box on the left to the box on the right doesn't happen spontaneously or certainly doesn't happen spontaneously in enough time to make a difference. And in fact, you need to have some external force that comes in and essentially starts to weave or seed that network um, to make individual connections as a hub with the atomized entities, bringing them together, showing and, and introducing and making connections so that they can in fact um, build a sustainable network and then that hub um, can, can start to step away. So the, the message, the context for talking about the project that I'm working on now is that I think it's crucial for us to move from the left-hand side to the right-hand side if all of those individual entities ever want to have an impact upon the $81 billion in the United States that's moving in the other direction. And there's a lot of empirical evidence that this is, is, is not off base. Um, in the, the top of this um, table, I cite four papers, but there are certainly many more. All of these papers share a commonality um, that they have looked at cities in the food space doing food systems change work and they sought to identify what was working and what was not. Each one of these papers in their own way identified the importance of connecting, if it's a municipality, connecting with other municipalities. If it's a, a functional area inside of a municipality, connecting with the other functional areas. If it's a not-for-profit NGO working in, in the food system, connecting with um, the environmental systems, connecting with um, social justice systems. Um, this idea of, of connection towards a common goal um, came up as a, as a common theme in these and many other papers. Below the blue line here um, are, are more theoretical papers that start to give us amazing new tools and technologies to build the social networks, to map the social networks, um, so that we can identify and, and help that left-hand panel become the interconnected um, connected web. And we have success, examples of success in the United States um, where networking really makes a difference. Um, in, I'm from New York State and the state right next to me, Vermont, a very small state, so a small example. But beginning in, in 2008 and then formally in 2011, they decided to take a new path. So instead of taking a hierarchical model of food systems change, they sought to build a network. And their project called Vermont Farm to Plate, which the first phase finished in 2020 and, and they are now um, beginning their second phase, was funded by the, the state of Vermont in collaboration with a not-for-profit and the University of Vermont. And they sought to map all of the work that was being done, find gaps in that work, build interconnections, and amplify instead of recreate what was already, be, already being done. As a result of their efforts, the sustainable food system economic output increased by 48% between 2011 and 2020. It created over 6,500 new jobs in the, in the food system, which is significant in, in a, a state that has about 600,000 people. And they almost tripled local food purchasing. That was so successful that other New England states are now doing the same, a very strong program in Rhode Island and Massachusetts, um, and programs developing. And there's now a network of those networks called Food Solutions New England. Each one of these builds in what are called network weavers, right? Hubs to connect all of the work that's being done. I'm from New York. New York is not as far ahead as our neighbors in Vermont or the other New England states, but we're getting started. 
And the project that I'm involved in now is called Vision 2050. It is like Vermont's was, funded by New York State in collaboration with an NGO, CAID, the Center for Agricultural Development and Entrepreneurship, in partnership with Cornell University, um, Columbia University, Hartwick College, where I'm from, and, and the State University of New York at, at Coble Skill. Vision 2050 really is New York's turn to try our hand at networking. It's meant to be collective and connective. So we are in phase one right now. We're, we're on track to finish up in June. And our goal is to identify and articulate to the New York State Legislature a unified vision for food systems in New York in 2050. And 2050 is very far off, so hopefully we'll get there before, before 2050. Um, we have three primary methodologies, a, a large farmer survey, um, some deep dive uh, sector analyses in, into agricultural sectors that are primary in New York State. Um, but the thing that I think is most relevant for today are these multi-stakeholder roundtable discussions. We have had 15 roundtable discussions, each one lasting 90 minutes, where we get into a virtual room. They're all being held on Zoom. Individuals from across the food system. So producers engaged in traditional agriculture, producers engaged in regenerative agriculture, um, people who are engaged in food equity, people who are engaged in um, land transition, uh, individuals who are doing institutional purchasing. And we ask the same questions to all of these individuals. Imagine that it's 2050 and we live in an equitable, resilient, profitable, and healthy food system. What does that look like to you? How do we get there? What are the barriers that we can overcome together that we couldn't overcome individually? And at this point, we've spoken to 75 individuals. We have about three more traditional roundtables left, plus um, some that we are doing explicitly with youth and some that are being done exclusively in Spanish because we have a lot of um, Spanish-speaking um, food system workers in our state. Um, three themes have come to the fore. Um, we need to educate. We need financial support. But even among the individuals, there's a call for coordination, a call to, to organize and coordinate the work that's being done for collective impact. Phase two, which we hope to begin with state support um, after we're done, will take these roundtable participants and use them to seed our initial network map and build out from there with some snowball sampling. Um, so that we'll be able to map the nodes and the ties, we'll be able to identify gaps and synergies and start to build a healthier network in New York State to get us where, um, where Vermont was able to go. And, and let me end with sort of the beginning of, of the title of the talk. What's the role of universities in, in this process? Um, I'm incredibly impressed with, with Averu and, and the connections that I'm seeing between the university and the community. And I think that's an amazing model that many universities can follow. And I think network weaving and network maintenance is a new possible um, tool that we can put in the traditional toolkit of the academy. Um, this project, relying upon support from Cornell and SUNY Cobleskill and Hartwick, is using those universities traditionally for research and technical support. We're also encouraging more institutional purchasing of, of local foods. We're obviously building education into that. Um, but a new step that I'm hoping that we're going to be taking successfully is using the universities and our students to help us with with the mapping and the monitoring and the managing of these networks. So I'm going to stop here. I look forward to, to questions um, and conversations, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Carlina.
not only for uh, uh, um, touching a, um, a topic, food, that it connects to our culture, identity, to our emotions, and in Portugal, food is a very important uh, uh, discussion, not only because of the environmental impact, but also of because of, and mainly because of our uh, cultural perspective and identity. And I was impressed by, by the Vermont experiment, experience and what you are doing now, and very keen to know more about the involvement of, of students at the undergraduate, undergraduate uh, level. So thank you very much. I will leave the questions to, to the end. I'm sure there will be a lot. Um, e vou voltar para o português para apresentar uh, o nosso distinto so convidado que encerrará o debate, o professor Jaime Cavalcante-Alves, magnífico Alves. reitor He's do Instituto Federal de Educação, Ciência e Tecnologia do Amazonas. É um prazer tê-lo tê connosco aqui em Aveiro. Um, possui pós-graduação a nível mestrado em Educação Agrícola, pela Universidade Federal Rural do Rio de Janeiro, uh, especialização em Nutrição Mineral de Plantas pela Escola Superior da Agricultura Luís de Queiroz da Universidade de São Paulo. Uh, fará seguramente uma divulgação perfeita ao tema que estivemos a discutir hoje. Possui graduação em Licenciatura Plena em Ciências Agrícolas pela Universidade Federal Rural do Rio de Janeiro, pelo Instituto Técnico em Agropecuária pela Escola Agrotécnica Federal de Manaus, pelo Instituto Federal de Educação, Ciência e Tecnologia de Manaus. Atualmente é professor de Educação Básica, Técnica e Tecnológica deste Instituto, atuando nas disciplinas de Mecanização Agrícola, Manejo e Conservação do Sol, Fruticultura, Agroecologia, Culturas Anuais. Uh, tem experiência na área da agronomia, com ênfase em agroecologia e manejo de conservação do solo, e a sua área de atuação é a agronomia, a engenharia agrícola, agroecologia e educação agrícola. Uh, foi diretor-geral uh, do IFAM Campus uh, uh, Tabatinga, Campus Tabatinga <laughs> no período 2012-2015, para o reitor do desenvolvimento institucional, institucional do Instituto Federal of the Federal no período 2015-2019, e atualmente é diretor-geral desta instituição of the uh, desde maio de 2019. Será um prazer tê-lo connosco para debater a educação para a sustentabilidade, promovendo o êxito e evitando o êxito uh, no interior do Amazonas por meio das escolas Amazon ribeirinhas. Por de Riverside Schools. Professor, Muito obrigado. Você está ouvindo normal? Obrigado. Você pode me emprestar. Você pode me emprestar. Obrigado. Bem, bo muito boa tarde a todos. Good afternoon, é com muita all. alegria e satisfação que nós say, estamos uh, with a great deal of satisfaction that we are here. First, let me thank you for having aqui me. Vocês, bringing para with várias you pessoas to you for many de outros países, from other countries, o que é educação profissional no Brasil e como se faz a educação profissional bem no seio da Amazônia brasileira, que é o estado da Amazônia. Mas, primeiramente, eu queria dedicar esse momento é, hoje, no Brasil, 15 de outubro, nós comemoramos o dia do professor. Ah, então, o dia do professor para nós é, é, é o momento, é um, um dia de reflexão, de alegria, pela, pela importância do professor para a formação de jovens, para a formação dos nossos profissionais. Our professionals. E eu queria aqui fazer uma, like uma homenagem, uma referência a uma, uma mulher a woman, é, negra, a black filha woman, de escravos, é, Antonieta de Barros, Antonieta que de foi Barros. a primeira mulher eleita deputada estadual é, no estado de Santa Catarina e foi a Santa primeira Catarina. mulher negra eleita deputada estadual no Brasil. Uh, e ela, em 1948, por achar que a educação é a principal ferramenta de desenvolvimento de uma sociedade, de emancipação, é uma ferramenta de desenvolvimento humano, ela, em 1948, instituiu o 15 de outubro como o dia do professor. Certo? Então, eu gostaria de fazer essa homenagem à Antonieta de Barros, em nome dela, homenagear todos os professores aqui presentes, todos os professores do mundo, em especial do nosso Instituto Federal da Amazônia, que estão nos acompanhando lá no Brasil nessa palestra. Então, eu gostaria de fazer essa homenagem hoje, 15 de outubro, dia do professor, é, em nosso país. O Instituto Federal da Amazônia, ele... 
e FAM. Ele faz parte de uma rede, de uma rede federal de educação profissional e tecnológica, que foi instituída é, em 2008, uma política pública do governo do Estado do Brasil, brasileiro, em, na gestão, então, do governo do Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva. Ele criou a Rede Federal de Educação Profissional e Tecnológica, criando 42 instituições no Brasil. E o Instituto Federal do Amazonas faz parte dessa rede. É uma das 42 instituições. É, o Estado do Amazonas ele está concentrado na Amazônia brasileira. É o maior estado do, do país. É, fica na região norte, fronteira ali com a Venezuela, fronteira com a Colômbia e fronteira com o Peru. É o maior estado, porém não é um estado tão populoso. É, é um dos menores estados em termos de população, mas o maior estado em termos de é, área territorial. E lá nós temos, no seio da Amazônia, é, dentro do estado do Amazonas, In o Instituto Federal de Educação, Ciência e Tecnologia. É, os institutos federais no Brasil, eles são classificados como uma instituição multicamp, então nós temos uma reitoria, no nosso caso funciona em Manaus, e nós temos 18 unidades espalhadas na Amazônia, como toda, que nós chamamos de campos. Então nós temos próximo ali no... É, os números 5, 6 e 7 são as unidades que ficam na capital do estado do Amazonas, e nós temos ao longo do estado do Amazonas, esse é o mapa do nosso estado, nós temos mais 15 unidades We have 15 units spread throughout the state of the Amazon. So, in terms of dimension, the number 5, 6 and 7, where we have the campus in Manaus, Campus Centro, Campus Centro Industrial and Campus Zona Leste, Eastern Area, alongside our rectorship, which is the 18, for the campus, which is in the number 14, to the west of the state, this distance is around 1,410 kilometers within the same state, within the same unit. So our roads are rivers, and rivers are not in a straight line. They are very, very curvy. And from Manaus to the f number 14, it's 2,500, 2,500 kilometers in terms of distance. Because we don't have roads, if you go by boat, it will take 15 days, 15 days. A plane, three and a half hours, inside the same district, inside the same state, without going to another state. So it is a region that is huge with many different uh, characteristics, different and difficult logistics, different shapes in terms of population, different shapes in terms of society, a campus uh, that is in the Parintins, which is to the west of the state, for the campus 15, which is Tabatinga, in the border of Brazil with Colombia and Peru, and the trades in the same state are completely different. This brings forward some difficulties so that we can have a uh, vocational education that brings uh, the school um, success into a higher perspective. But these are challenges, challenges that we need to face in teaching, challenges that we have in research and for the technological increase. All our format in terms of methodology, all our pro projects, they take into consideration those differences, those realities, this class division, and mainly they take into consideration the sustainability of the Amazon ecosystem. We are pressured as an institution of research and extension to the preservation of the Amazon forests, but we are also pressured by the community itself in the Amazon wanting to develop 
want to get knowledgeable in how to add this knowledge to sustainability. That is the greatest challenge of the institution, which is at the core of the Amazon. Then is a development with the preservation of Amazon. Scientific knowledge, academic knowledge, alongside traditional knowledge, the knowledge of traditional populations of the indigenous people would have accumulated knowledge of decades and decades with those who have it river, their ways of living and their way of survival. So this academic knowledge with those who defend the forest, who live from the forest and by the forest, so our challenge as an institution is quite é, big, mas ao mesmo problematic tempo, too, but at the same time it's quite challenging and quite satisfactory so that we can develop this technology in this institution. So these 18 units, it's an institution that uh, as a network, as an institution, as a way of education, and it started in 1909. So Nilo Peçanha, he was the first black president that Brazil had in 1909, created the first school of handcrafters and artisans. So this school uh, there were people who had no access to schools, so Nil Pesang, the president, was thinking about a model of an institution that could professionalize these people, uh, that would bring these people into the institution, so they could become professionals, artisans, handcrafters, but that they could be uh, within the labor world, in a dignified world, with professional recognition. In 1937, this school was transformed in the industrial high school in Manaus. Uh, we brought it to Amazon. So in this city, we had in 1937 the first industrial high school, which was schools to train for the industry. We had the apogee of the rubber extraction in the Amazon. So the Amazon at this time was considered considered the richest area of the country. So we needed to qualify labor to understand this reality. In 1942, we had the Federal Technical School of Manaus creating courses of the industrial field. In 1965, the federal government has a technical school of the Amazon. In 79, the agricultural part comes about within our state, where the agrotechnical school of Manaus I, I was a student of that school, actually, with, uh, I finished the technical course in 1993, we created our technical school of São Gabriel da Cachoeira which is the school which is here at number 16, it's in a region called the region of the dog's head, border of Brazil with Colombia and Venezuela, where you have the peak of the mist, peak Venabolin, it's the most indigenous place in the world. 92% of the students of this school, number 16, which is the Campus São Gabriel da Cachoeira, are indigenous. So it's 23 different uh, um, tribes, so there is very different, I think it's f around 22 different languages. All of them speak Portuguese, but the main, Negatu, which is the main language, and it's a, a, a main language that uh, branched into other languages of the region, and the courses are connected to the development of indigenous communities. So this campus was created in 1993. In 2001, we created the Federal Center of Technological Education in the Amazon, and in 08, we got to be where we are today. The Federal Institution of Education, Science and Technology of the Amazon, the IFAM, 
with 18 units. As I said, it was a, a law by Lula da Silva, and all the schools, technical schools, agricultural schools of Brazil, were connected into an institution of uh, technological and vocational education, which are the federal institutes. There was a landmark here when we stopped being a middle school to an institution of higher education with the capacity of working not just education, but also research, innovation. So there was a leap in terms of quality and in actions with this law. Our institutional mission of our federal institute of the Amazon, we want to promote co-excellence in education, science and technology for the sustainable development of the Amazon. We can never escape this reality. We need to look for the development of the Amazon, but abiding to its characteristics. We have 26,600 students in all municipalities of the state of the Amazon and 18 graduation courses that are called licenciatura in Portugal. We have postgraduate degrees and we also have MAs and PhDs. So the verticalization of federal institutes, it's big. We have courses of basic training for people with no demands in terms of school degree, quick courses, and also to PhDs on the other side of the spectrum. So not a lot of institutions in the world. And there is a school in Rio, which is an historical school, it's part of our network, which is Pedro II School. Now we only have one in Rio that is for child education from preschool to PhD. And we have students who went to this institution in education, child education, with a PhD in this institution, and now they are professors of this institution. So it's a very important verticalization. It was an innovative project in 08. And many countries of the world have adopted this model of education based on federal institutes of the Brazilian government. These are some units that we have. We are in 23 municipalities of the Amazon. We have a course in the neighboring state, which is Goraim, in the, in the border with Venezuela. We have 17 units that we call CAMP. We have a reference center, and we have 24 campus of e-learning teaching. So not just in person, but the difficult of getting to places and getting to the communities, to municipalities. We use long distance learning as a methodology to bring knowledge in, to bring education to distant communities where there are no hypotheses of being there physically. We have our global goals on the state of the Amazon. We want to eradicate poverty. One of the main missions of ours, of our courses, aims at the eradication of poverty in the Amazon, especially, which is the poorest region in the country, based upon a policy of zero hunger. We also work to favor and develop the health and well-being of the population. We try to find quality education. Uh, gender equality, it's something that we are very worried in, in our institution. And we try to work with a clean energy. We are the greenest institute in Brazil, not just because we are in the Amazon, but because our institutional policies such for these initiatives. We don't have a, cult, a course of agronomy. We have a course of agroecology, which is something different. It's our action line. We have a course of veterinary medicine that it's not traditional at all. We look for the handling, production, 
based upon the issues of using our animals in the Amazon from the point of view of preservation of those animals and also the research. All our courses are within this line using this issue of sustainability. And with that sustainability, generation of uh, employment and income for population of the Amazon. This is a course of veterinary medicine, taking into consideration always the issue of the Amazon. We have a veterinary hospital in our institution and we have uh, specific animals from the Amazon. We have professionals with a PhD based on this production, but we also work with uh, domestic animals and pets because we need to bring them into the labor world. So here is one of the veterinary hospitals. You are one of the six institutes of the 42. We are a core of innovation. We have an institution in Brazil called Embrapi, which is a Brazilian company of research and technological innovation. And it uh, accredits institutions in Brazil to create innovation centers. We only have six in Brazil. I mean, we have 12 in Brazil. And one of those 12 is our IFAM. Because not just being in the forest, we are in an industrial area that is quite strong. In 1964, with the purpose of bringing resources into the Amazon, with the federal government created an area of free trade called the uh, Zona Franca of Manaus, and we have one of the greatest industrial parks in Latin America. So our institution is also quite close to this industrial park leading for the training of labor and developing technologies via technological innovation to answer to the production based on sustainability. So companies, multinational companies, are clients too, companies that will get technologies from us. So there is a role of working with bioeconomy, biosustainability. So we have projects within the center aiming towards the usage of products from the forest, researching, studying those products, making them, turning them into businesses to our community. So we have this laboratory with components for bikes. In our industrial government house, we have an industry of vehicles, two-wheeled vehicles bikes and, and motorbikes and they would come to France to test this and now our institution with the support of institution the private institutions and this is defined by the Metrology Institute of Brazil so that we can test those industries. We are one of the six nanomaterial laboratories in Brazil. And we are headquartering the meeting of BRICS, of nanotechnology materials in Manaus. So this is the industrial campus and directorship of IFA that aims towards the development of new materials for different areas, agricultural, biology, chemistry, mat construction materials, pharmaceutical products, using nanotechnology. So we are one of the six in the country. This is just to develop technology, but qualified labor in Amazon. We have very 
important actions in the industrial cluster, one of the biggest in Latin America in Industry 4.0, research, teaching, public-private partnership, nanotechnology, automation and control, and mechanical trials to answer the needs of the industry. And we have public-private partnerships, which is a very strong brand of ours. In Brazil, within the Amazon, we have the trading network, we have these companies that are within the industrial unit of Manaus. They are exempt of taxes, tax incentives, so that they can bring development. So there is a law that we call computer law, stating that 5% of the income of these companies needs to go towards an institution of science and technology. It's a relatively high value, but via our innovation center, we have innovation establishing public and private partnerships with the goal of funding projects of scientific initiation research tech innovation. This is one other resource beyond the budget of the union, okay? And now, again, with the traits of the Amazon, we have systemic actions of big dimensions. We have indirectorship, our core of indigenous school initiatives. So the indigenous people are frequent students in all our units. So we always try via this center to study, to research proper methodologies to answer the needs of this indigenous population. They are very, very important to us. So we created policies, guidelines, we have a postgraduate degree in, in indigenous school teaching and education. We train experts. We have a center to perfect indigenous language. We have a language center. It's not just English, not just Spanish. The indigenous languages are also approached and addressed. And we have also the African Brazilian Research Center, all the communities of the Amazon, Quilombola, which has a very important role within the historical context of the Amazon. And we also work with research and actions turned to those Quilombola. And also for uh, Ribeirinhos, people, Mr. Uh, River people, in a free translation, of course, many actions with indigenous communities in our institutions. This was a course for the specialization and expertise in indigenous school education. Professor Venancio. It's the gentleman in the black sport coat. He's our previous rector. He was supposed to be here to represent IFAM, but unfortunately he died because of COVID in January. He was very young and COVID took him, so that's why we're here. So I would like to dedicate this presentation to our dear rector who left us in such a quick manner because of COVID-19. Some actions and participation of our projects with indigenous. We also have a social center of Aldeia Moraí, where we have a course within the village itself with indigenous using our own methodologies for the indigenous community. The Campo São Gabriel da Cachoeira, as I said, it's uh, in the dog's head. It's the oldest indigenous campus in the world. We have 23 tribes in 14 languages in this institution. To answer to the mission of this campus, we have anthropologists, we have uh, linguistics, and also we have the language center. 
So we need to be within the core of the community. We need to be within society. Here's a video. So we have many actions and communities helping us. It's we bring to us needs so that we can study with the development of research, with the development of technologies. Então, são várias ações, eu vou passando um pouquinho é, Many actions. mais rápido. Aqui é outro curso Let me go a bit quicker. This is another course that we have in an indigenous community next to Manaus. É and this video here is very quick and I hereby finish my presentation. Quando eu visitei essa escola, Dr. Jacobina, aqui na comunidade de São Félix, so the school had a lot of holes in the walls, so I got to realize that bees were coming out of those holes. They had killed colonies of those bees because they were afraid that the children would be stinged by them. So this bees is one of the main bees of the Amazon for honey. So the project began with this in mind. Before, you used to create bees, but this beekeeping culture was lost, so bees were not a thing anymore. But this is the third year of this project, and we want to make this a continuous activity. Of course, we are raising awareness so that people get to know bees and take care of them, preserve them, and from there on to transform this into an economic alternative for this community and for others. This is IFAM, a bit of what we do, and this is our challenge, further and further to look for economic development social development alongside the preservation of the Amazon region, bringing knowledge to industries without harming the environment, but also to train capable citizens so they can develop this industry that is already established in the region, but also to look for opportunities within our Amazon forest of survival with dignity. Here's our institutional mission. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to share it with you.
We are very grateful to you for sharing with us the challenges of such a vast territory as is the Amazon. And it's similar to challenges that we have in Portugal, too. So this extension knowledge, uh, education to improvement of life conditions of population, I think that we are now much more knowledgeable. And let me take advantage of this. It's for a question in English. Learning Portuguese with all the presentations in Portugal. Thank you. You are there alive <laughs> with, with a lot of energy. Thank you. Um, and I would like to open the debate and to please ask you all uh, if you have any question, uh, alguma pergunta a colocar algum dos nossos oradores. Any question to any of our speakers? Anything that you would like them to explore <laughs> further? Speakers, if you want to uh, question yourself. <laughs> We have a roving mic, so this there is translation for Matthias, right? Matthias, you're getting you're getting the interpreting, right? Great. So this difficult balance of, well, balancing the life of population, prosperity, poverty, social justice with the environmental challenges that we face in the Amazon, and the Amazon is a paradigm. It's a clear example of a critical territory for the global process of the survival of all beings of the planet. Even these challenges, the paper service in terms of environment in Brazil, it's innovative all over the world. And the changes trying to cherish and value uh, technology and sometimes critical resource as is what we have in terms of the environment are forgotten. And I think this brings important challenges for the context of the Amazon, for the context of the professionalization of knowledge, schools, education in the Amazon. One of my questions is how can we use education, how can we use technology, universities, connection with communities to tell stories in a different manner to relearn our society so that we reposition towards the future with an optimistic perspective by Mathis. Uh, we need to envision the future as something that's different, but surely will re-qualify the way we live. And how will we face this change of our lives so that these narratives can be heard and come across to companies, to policymakers? This is a very broad question, I know, but how can we uh, make this go across to industries? And I have a, a quote by David Thorpe about One Planet Cities, and it is a quote, so here it is. It is a constant source of surprise to me, Walter, and surprise that I remain surprised that more is not said about these huge survival threatening challenges in the popular media, nor about the heroic heroic efforts to meet them undertaken by courageous pioneers everywhere. So we had the opportunity to give voice here to courageous pioneers and courageous projects uh, that inspire and that can spread stories uh, to transform tomorrow, the tomorrow that will come for sure. <laughs> Any recommendation of how to tell these, how to spread these stories, how to mobilize us? even faster and in more disruptive ways. <laughs> Sorry for this English and Portuguese at the same time. <laughs> any answers, any questions? OK. Primeiramente, nós temos que nós First, we need to untie and bust some of the prejudices that we have towards the Amazon. 
it's still a common place to say that Amazon does not develop because we cannot destroy the trees. We cannot create big industries because there are environmental laws preventing it. Agriculture, livestock in the Amazon is never developed because the environmental law is very, very difficult to overcome and I can only destroy 20% of my land so that I can develop an economic activity based in agriculture. Development models cannot be created because natives dominate most of the land in the Amazon. So, first, we need to get rid of all of this, get rid of all of these sayings. How can we do it? We need to first know what the Amazon is, then to understand the potential that the Amazon has. It is much more profitable economically standing than after you destroy the wood. Because if you tear down the wood, the forest, you will have a momentaneous activity short-term economy. You will destroy fauna, you will destroy the flora, and you won't have any sustainability. So this is the first challenge. Understanding the Amazon as something that's profitable as is, and it is profitable. There is a possibility, we have the possibility of developing communities who live in the Amazon with dignity, with a proper income, by destroying the minimum possible of the forest. We need to think out of the box of our institution. We need to go to the community, study their culture, study the mechanisms of how the forest itself behaves before the community and then develop sustainable agriculture initiatives, livestock, because the technology exists, making it that industries, and I spoke one of the biggest industrial clusters in the Latin America, in Manaus, and it's almost non-pollutant. Why? Because we have developed technologies that prevent it from being pollutant. So we need to bring this to our society and then to our public bodies. Brazil is so huge that someone who is in Brasilia or in the south of the country doesn't know what Amazonia is. The central government, central power, which is in the center, doesn't know about the Amazons. Our logistics are so hard that we have to have a governmental uh, network that would be much, much bigger. Our need for infrastructures, for logistics is huge, but our government doesn't agree. They think that there are no inequalities in Brazil. There is something called the Amazon cost, and this Amazon cost is not taken into consideration, and it means how much it costs to do things in the Amazon because of how remote it is. We need to have public and private partnerships to have added value, to develop new actions. So that's the first thing. We need to destroy this prejudice that the Amazon does not develop because of the river people, because of the indigenous people. But then we must study development projects that are proper, that are adequate for the Amazon. So, people living in the Amazon and living well. Any, any final words? 
We have to close soon. <laughs> Do you want to say any final words? Ma Mathis, you, you, do, do you have something to say? The moderator is speaking in English. I thought you were following. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you very much. I think one of the main things, and thank you so much for all the wonderful contributions from the panel, uh, one of the main things, I think, is how we hold our narratives. Too often, particularly in urban areas, the privileged elite, which I'm part of because I live in a city that is well-fed, etc., we talk about all this tragedy of the commons. How do we need to be nice to the rest of the world? How nice am I willing to be? Rather than turning it upside down and recognizing there's not that much tragedy of the commons. If we don't prepare ourselves for the future we can anticipate, we will not be prepared. There's a lot of agency. There's a lot of necessity. And that's why we can act. We don't need to wait for the others. Thank you. E, de facto, tirar os nossos preconceitos and e construir uh, uh, outros conceitos com outros valores para, para, para concepts, o futuro different Carolina, values looking for um, a again, new value. thank you, Sarah, value. and the organizers of, of, of this panel. It's, it's amazing to me to hear such people coming from such different spheres, um, from, from film, um, from, from education, um, I'm from the great work that, that Dr. Wagner Michael is doing. And I think we're all in this together. And, and um, I, I think of the first day of my classes when I have my students do the footprint, the ecological footprint, and I look at their reactions. And always someone will raise their hand and say, I have four, which means they're consuming four times what the earth can support. And they say, is this bad? And when I explain what that means, they start to say, but in my house, I, you know, we eat organic food or we, and I say, how big is your house? And they say, well, it's five bedrooms and three bathrooms. And, and I think it's that realization that, that we are all living part of the problem. We're teaching part of the problem. And, and so I commend the work that you're doing starting to teach more of the solution. I think it's all of our jobs to, to teach the solution so that our children, so that, that my daughter who's sitting here, um, will have the world that they deserve and not the world that we've left them. So thank you all very much. This has been an amazing panel. Muito obrigada. Um grande obrigada a todos e uma grande salva de palmas. Thank you all. A round of applause to you all. We are about to finish. Com uma frase que o professor Celso também nos trouxe, com a circularidade dos saberes, foi acho que uma excelente forma de perceber como é o mundo. É uma brilhante maneira de seguir como diferentes contribuições de circularidade, de círculo, se quiser, de conhecimentos diferentes, que nos trazem soluções possíveis, reais e de formas de transformar a realidade que queremos. E formas de soluções que podem transformar a realidade que queremos. E formas de soluções que podem transformar a realidade que queremos that we want. Thank you all. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. We will now present the three winners of Aveiro 5G challenges, which will be announced by André Costa from the municipality of Aveiro. Muito, muito boa tarde a todos. Um, antes de mais, gostaria de agradecer First à Sara e aos nossos, Sarah nossos ilustres oradores a presença nesta última Tech Session da Aveiro Tech, 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 Tech Week. Foi um prazer acompanhar a vossa, a vossa sessão. Dizer-vos que de hoje de manhã, neste mesmo auditório do Teatro Aveirense, assistimos ao final pitch dos, dos concorrentes à segunda edição do Aveiro 5G Challenge e, e, portanto, em representação deste, do júri deste, deste concurso, que inclui não só o representante da Câmara de Aveiro, mas também representantes da Altice Labs, da Ericsson, do ClusterTis.pt e da Universidade de Aveiro. E quem desde já agradeço a vossa disponibilidade para ao longo destes últimos meses acompanharem o desenvolvimento destes projetos e terem tido o dia de hoje 
para and nos apoiarem na avaliação desses, desses mesmos projetos. Uh, e cabe-me a mim agora, and neste momento, anunciar aqueles que são I'm os três vencedores, não sem antes uh, lembrar aqueles que são alguns dos, dos objetivos deste, uh, deste concurso. Uh, existe em Aveiro uh, a única infraestrutura in Aveiro, com, com uma rede 5G instalada em centro urbano uh, da cidade, que tem propiciado a que startups, uh, scale-ups, centros de investigação, universidades, possam testar uh, e prototipar produtos e serviços que necessitem destas características de uma rede de 5G. E esta passada quarta-feira, numa sessão que tivemos para avaliar os resultados do Aveiro of the tech city, we were very pleased to see that in the last two years we were able to overcome our goals with more than 30 different projects using our Avertech City Living Lab, being able to test and develop their products before launching them into the market. So within the scope beyond the Telecom Institute, it's very important to support that we have coming from Altislavs and Ericsson, to whom I would like to thank within the scope of this process and this living lab that we have in Aveiro. Without further ado, the award that we have for three startups is 25,000 euros for each of them. And in the beginning of this process, we had 29 candidates, 10 finalists, and all be smart, cycle AI, and infinite foundry. A round of applause for these entities, please. Winners of the Aveiro 5G Challenge. I don't know if the entities are here or not. I don't know if they are. I see Paulo there. You don't need to come here, but let me thank you for everything that you have been do, that you have done, and I hope that you continue to use our living lab and the possibilities that we create to attract talent and companies into our city and into our region. Thank you all. This is the last session of Tech Week, but let me tell you that tonight we have the Light Festival Prisma. And now I invite you all to visit it. We have different artistic installations of Kriatec and a set of activities that will happen during the weekend, specifically for children, for young people in the gaming area in the Aveiro University and also in Parque de Exposições. Thank you.